All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. You, I don't need to spend much time here because there's lots of um, great uh, material to hear from our speakers. I want to just welcome everybody to our final CEF seminar of the of 2020, of the fall quarter of 2020. Uh, it's all going to be uphill from here, I guess, because it won't be 2020 anymore. Uh, but I'm really excited about um, this uh, final seminar, uh, continuing in our um, series celebrating the promotions um, of faculty this year, and um, happy to celebrate with Aaron, uh, Aaron Worsing, who's uh, been here at UW since 2008, was promoted to associate professor in 2014, and just this year promoted to full professor. He runs the Predator Ecology Lab, uh, which is uh, the topic of the seminar today, looking at the role of uh, large predators and the effects on non-consumptive effects on other populations and behavior. Um, and I, uh, a reminder, I invited all our speakers to uh, bring a, uh, a guest along to um, show how collaboration works, uh, mentorship, whatever the sort of relationship is. And um, Aaron invited Mike Heithouse, who's a professor in biological sciences at Florida International University. And he works on behavior, ecological importance, and conservation of large marine taxes. So it's a, a terrestrial marine partnership here. Um, and uh, like Aaron, I guess, was a PhD student at Simon Fraser University um, and started his work at Shark Bay, Australia. He's co-lead of the Global Finprint Project, a uh, worldwide survey of sharks and rays, supported by the uh, local family foundation, Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. Um, he's developed programs for K-12 classrooms, appeared in multiple docu documentary films, he was the Director of Marine Sciences at FIU and is now Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences and Education. So welcome to both of you and take it away. Thank you for being here. All Thanks, right, I uh, hope everybody can hear me well. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Dan. And uh, Mike, I don't think you have enough on your plate. I think you need to pick up a few more things there. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I, I want to join Dan and everyone else in wel welcoming Mike who's tuning in from the East Coast in Miami where as he's told me it's a frigid 48. So actually not, not too different from what we're experiencing uh, right now. And I also want to say that I'm, I'm especially pleased to be giving this talk and sharing this time with you for a couple of reasons. The first of which is that uh, in particular because I'm giving it with Mike, it's a, it's a culmination of a promise that I made about 12 years ago when I was actually interviewing for the position I currently hold uh, in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, and that was to apply what I had learned at the time about predator-prey interactions between sharks uh, and some of their prey species to better understand and predict the nature of interactions between large terrestrial predators like wolves and mountain lions uh, and their prey here in terrestrial ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest, including the Washington. And I'll return to that promise a little bit later in the talk after Mike goes. But the second thing is that, uh, as Dan mentioned, Mike and I go back a long way, back to 2001, in fact, uh, when he was wrapping up his PhD in Larry Dill's lab at Simon Fraser University. And I was interviewing with Larry at the same time as a prospective doctoral student, we immediately hit it off given our shared interest in long-term ecological research and predator-prey interactions. And we've been great friends and collaborators practically ever since. But in all that time, it makes me feel old to say this, but we're approaching 20 years, uh, we very rarely had the chance to actually co-deliver a talk. And so I view this seminar as a really special opportunity to share with you some of the fruits of our collaboration. Uh, and uh, I really want to thank Dan for providing the forum for us to do that. And I also want to thank all of you out there in a remote audience, including those who have tuned in from the East Coast, uh, for joining us. Uh, in particular, those of you who are undergraduates, rising scientists, and early career scientists, because we really tailored this talk for you. And that's the last thing I want to say. As I dive in here, and I think Mike would share the same sentiment, we've really constructed this presentation more as a conversation 
uh, than as a formal presentation. So we strongly encourage you, whenever the mood strikes, to chime into the chat with a, any question or observation, and we will do our best to address it. And Mike and I are both very happy to go on as many tangents as you like uh, within the allotted time. So please do that. Uh, okay, so having said all that, let's go ahead and dive in with a little bit of background. So long-term ecological research, which we define as studies of sufficient duration to capture the effects of rare or slow-acting phenomena in ecosystems have contributed immensely over the years to our understanding of animal ecology and evolution. Uh, just plucking one of countless examples, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the long-term work of Rosemary and Peter Grant, who over 40 years used the Galapagos Islands as a natural experiment to better understand how environmental variation, and in particular, rare environmental events like droughts and floods, shaped an adaptive radiation of finches from a common ancestor to the myriad species we see today whose different beaks, as you can see from this diagram, have been honed by natural selection to perform particular uh, foraging tasks. And the special properties of long-term ecological research also lend these kinds of studies to furnishing highly valuable conservation insights. Um, and in fact, as Professor Tony Sinclair told us a few years ago, when he was delivering his Sustaining Our World guest lecture in the School of Environmental Forest Sciences, it took nearly 50 years of research in the Serengeti for biologists to be able to figure out that it was anthropogenic fire management much more so than elephant herbivory that was primarily responsible for the decline of mature woodlands on the African savanna, uh, helping to lead to an end to co uh, calls for elephant culling. So it's not surprising then that long-term ecological studies are cited by scientists uh, to an extent greater than their shorter-term peers. As this figure shows, for example, um, the percentage of long-term studies in any particular scientific journal correlates positively and significantly with that journal's impact factor, which is a measure of the rate at which papers in a journal are used by and therefore normally endorsed by fellow scientists. The results of long-term studies are also disproportionately likely to make their way into sort of policy briefs and reports that are used by agencies to set uh, management environmental policy. As you can see from this figure, for example, U.S. National Research Council or NRC reports are much more likely to include long-term research than, um, than uh, shorter duration studies, specifically the top percentile, or the, the top 25% of the 75th percentile, the longest duration studies in NRC reports, are between five and 40 years longer than equivalent studies from the general scientific literature in the same top 25 percentile. So again, these NRC reports, which are highly influential syntheses, scientific syntheses for informing US environmental policy, disproportionately likely to include long duration ecological studies. And yet, Despite all this, there has been a decline in funding for long-term ecological research. Uh, as indicated by this figure here, the total amount of the National Science Foundation funding for long-term research has declined significantly over the last decade or so, as indicated by the red line here, even as support for shorter-term studies, those typically under five years, has increased from NSF in the same span. With this trend in mind, uh, our main goal for you today is to draw on our shared experiences uh, engaging in long-term research to advocate for this approach, and also to encourage those of you in the audience, and in particular those of you who are aspiring and early career scientists, to get involved in these kinds of studies because of their many benefits. And because of that, it's time for me to turn the floor over to Mike. Take it away, Mike. Great, thanks, Aaron. And we're going to see how well we can do the uh, flip the presentation over here. Uh, okay, I've stopped share. Okay, and uh, I should be sharing now. Everybody, hopefully, I see exactly the same slide you saw before. I also, yeah, I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to be here. Please feel free to use that chat function uh, as we're talking here, and you know, we can go on whatever tangents you want. And I also want to thank Aaron, by the way, I think you've used our quota of graphs and figures for this talk. 
So I'm just going to show a bunch of pretty pictures now and, and try to tell a story. Because again, you know, we really want your engagement because nobody wants to spend an hour just, you know, staring at a screen, uh, listening us, to us talk. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today takes us about as far away from uh, Fort Lauderdale and Miami, Florida, as you can get on the planet and still be on dry land, at least at night. And that's, uh, you know, Shark Bay, Western Australia. And you may ask, why would you travel halfway around the world uh, to study marine species when a lot of those species are actually out our, our back door here in Miami? And the answer was really that this was, at the time Aaron and I started, one of the most pristine places on the planet. Um, you know, nowhere is untouched by people, but this was probably as close as you could get to seeing what the oceans uh, used to look like. And just as a, a bit of a um, direction finder in Shark Bay, it, it's a World Heritage Area, um, and it was named that because of uh, it's amazing ecological and also anthropological uh, resources there. Um, for some reason, the stromatolites, for any geoscientists out there, are a huge draw there, uh, resembling some of the first life to appear on the planet. Um, it's kind of a been there, done there, that thing. It's a big rock, uh, but scientifically very cool. Um, and it has among the largest contiguous seagrass beds uh, in the entire world. So globally significant sea seagrasses, and then the big megafauna, including endangered species uh, like the dugong, which is Australia's version of, of a manatee for anyone from Florida in the audience. And so, you know, this recognition that this place was so amazing led to the World Heritage um, designation. And despite that, had been really largely overlooked by scientists, um, with the exception of people studying dolphins. And the reason that uh, people were there studying dolphins is because it's one of the few places in the world where you can go and get very close to wild dolphins uh, that are habituated. So before I got started in Shark Bay, this is actually a, you know, what I knew about the place. It was a place where people would come and feed wild dolphins at the shore in the morning and then the dolphins would go off um, and do their thing and still be wild dolphins. And you know, when I was an undergraduate, I was actually very interested in dolphins and wanted to study their behavior. And uh, just kind of as one of those suggestions to our undergrads in, in the audience, go to conferences, meet as many people as you can, because you never know what'll happen. Because I was uh, lucky enough to meet uh, this gentleman, Richard Connor, um, who I met at a, a marine mammal conference. And luckily for me, he is not only a genius scientist, uh, he is also very disorganized. And so about two weeks before he was going in the field, he sent me an email and said, I can't remember who you are. I think you're a master's student. I was 18 years old um, and in undergrad, but I found your email on a napkin. And do you want to come be my assistant in Shark Bay, Western Australia? Um, and of course I said yes, um, and managed to find my way there. Um, there are more stories I can tell about just getting to meet Richard in Australia than I care to uh, tell. Uh, many of which my mom still don't know, and it's probably better that way. But it gave me an introduction to Shark Bay and to watch these dolphins up close, where you can be close to them for hours on end, see the intricacies of their behavior. Um, you could really see everything uh, that they were doing. The next thing that was very lucky for me in that time period is that while I was R Richard's assistant, I was actually thinking about what projects I might like to do uh, for my graduate work there. And at about that time, um, Larry Dill on the right, that's me a little bit younger on the left, it, only five or six years ago, right, Aaron? There's no way we've been there 20 years. Um, but Larry Dill came on his sabbatical, which uh, I would say was the drinking tour, I mean, his research tour of Australia. And you know, he came in and wanted to uh, see these amazing dolphins. And I started talking to him and his interests in foraging behavior. Um, so fast forward a couple years, I graduated from school and, and ended up in Larry's lab, going down to Shark Bay on a shoestring um, to try to figure out um, how dolphins made decisions about where to spend their time when they're foraging. And what I wanted to do was look across this landscape of Shark Bay, these shallow seagrass beds um, where there looks like there's lots of life, and then the deeper waters, which are pretty much sandy. And okay, any oceanographers out there are going to laugh at us. In Shark Bay, deep waters are 10 to 12 meters deep. But the shallow waters are, you know, usually two meters deep, maybe down to about four and a half meters. So it's all relative, right? 
Um, and so we wanted to look at how dolphins were deciding where to spend their time um, in the shallow and deep waters based on where their food was. And you know, there were two options here, and this is where I'll, I'll give another bit of advice, which is read way outside the area that you're working on. Because when I went to approach this, we didn't know a lot about dolphin foraging behavior other than kind of how they caught their prey. And so the things that really helped me come up and move from just describing dolphin foraging to actually asking questions and testing hypotheses was to look at mathematical models, read about guppies, and read about wild dogs and some of these other species that had been followed for years. And so based on that kind of theoretical understanding, we were able to use theory to make predictions about where dolphins uh, should spend their time between these shallow and deep habitats. And after about one semester, I actually thought I was a genius because it turned out that the dolphins were almost exactly matching the predictions that we had based on theory called ideal free distribution. And there's about three times as much food in the shallow as the deep and dolphins were feeding about three times as many were feeding in the shallow as the deep all, all seemed right. Um, and this was during a winter and then the water warmed up and we kept doing our studies. I guess we should have stopped uh, because once the water temperature warmed up, it all went out the window. Still tons of fish in the shallows, um, but almost no dolphins feeding there. And so we had to go back totally to the drawing board and say, well, what's going on? And so be a natural historian and go out there and just observe what's going on because you never know where, where that's going to lead. And one of the things we noticed right away is that about 70% of these dolphins had these scars on them um, or open wounds from where they'd been attacked by tiger sharks. And so that really quickly led to wondering about trade-offs and how important might the presence of tiger sharks be um, to the behavior of dolphins. And I remember when I first got back my first grant proposal as a graduate student to study shark dolphin interactions and one of the reviewers had angrily in red pen scrawled in block letters, impossible, where they were so angry they'd scratched through the paper. Um, but impossible just means give it a try. Um, and so we were able to go out and start studying these tiger sharks. Um, and this is where I will say, and this is something I tell kids in school all the time too, it is really good to be wrong. Because usually when our hypotheses are not correct is when we learn the most or we make the biggest uh, leaps forward. And so that first thought that should, dolphins wouldn't really have to worry about sharks, they're too smart, they should just be worried about food. The fact that we were wrong led us in a whole different direction. And as I started looking at these sharks and seeing all the other animals out there, um, it turned out there was another lucky thing I did, which was as I was recording data on the dolphins, I was also collecting data on the other species I saw, um, which includes a lot of the rest of the food web, like um, the sea turtles, the sea snakes, the dugongs. And you know, although the data I collected wasn't enough to really do much with, it was that first bits uh, that could open the door to what ended up becoming the Shark Bay Ecosystem Research Project. Um, and going through the year, you know, many years and many students um, and many PIs to really try to understand how important tiger sharks in the, are in the bay. And with shark populations declining around the world, 90% or more in many places, to really have to answer that question, what happens when you lose sharks? Or do we need to be thinking about trying to rebuild shark populations to restore function? And you know, for those of you that wonder, can tiger sharks really matter to these species? The answer is yes. I mean, tiger sharks are big, huge head at the front of their head, uh, lots of uh, very sharp serrated teeth, so they can actually latch onto a turtle, saw their jaws back and forth and cut through a turtle shell. Um, and it even gets better than that. I hope, every, well, those on the East Coast have eaten, so be careful with this one. On the West Coast, you may want to wait a little bit, but you know, tiger sharks, once they've got that turtle and then they have that problem of their shell in their stomach, but they can digest the good parts and then turn their stomachs inside out through their mouth, get rid of the shell, suck their stomach back down and they're ready to go again. Um, so even these big prey that live a long time um, have to worry about sharks. And so we've really been trying to understand what are going, what's the importance of sharks and predation risk in driving this system, not by the body count, but by how they might scare prey. And again, that whole idea came out of studies of bluegill sunfish, uh, baboons, guppies, and, and that, broader information helped guide our understanding in, in Shark Bay. So I'm going to look 
uh, show a video. Uh, Aaron, start waving at me if the internet here in Florida can't take 50 degrees and it's jumpy. But this will just give you a little bit of, of no, what Shark Bay looks like. And yes, it was shot when Aaron and I were much younger. Such a big, <laughs> vibrant, relatively untouched seagrass ecosystem. It's pretty much unheard of. It has one of the most amazing assemblages of animals on the planet. But there's one species that's particularly critical here. The presence of tiger sharks changes the dynamics of the bay. Our work with tiger sharks focuses on when they're here, how many are here, and which habitats they prefer. 267! One of our main goals is to understand the role of tiger sharks in this ecosystem. With this information, we can predict what might happen in other places where sharks are disappearing. It turns out to learn about tiger sharks, you have to spend about 95% of your time studying their prey. Oh, that was definitely just one year ago, right? <laughs> Other disclaimer is our buddy Patrick had just learned how to use the slow-mo when we shot this, so it's a little gratuitous. You know, we have to catch these animals, that's the only way to study them, but we try to minimize any stress that they might have had. And one of the things you'll see in this video is just how many people are involved. None of this work is one person, none of this work is a couple people. It is many teams working over many, many years. And in fact, over one period of a decade, we had teams in the field 365 days a year and it took that level of effort and that much work to really answer some of the questions we've been uh been going uh, going towards and we have one of the, the world's most in-depth studies of a single ecosystem with intact large predator populations yeah we're way past 12 now what are we on almost tw more than 20 now uh, on this project. And it is that time of the year, you know, Larry is not Santa, but he will play one at your Christmas party. Yeah, so you get the idea. We don't, it, as we wrap up here, I mean, you know, really what we're trying to do is understand in Shark Bay, using that pristine ecosystem to understand what the oceans used to look like, what they can look like. Because if we can understand the function of intact systems, we might be able to use that information to restore places, including like the waters off of Florida that are a lot heavily, more heavily impacted, but feature some very similar species, and in some cases, the same species. But yeah. as I mentioned, uh, it takes a, an absolutely monstrous team of collaborators from all over uh, to do this work. Um, and Aaron, you know, once I finished my PhD, he took it to the next level and helped move it along. And then we were able to team back up uh, again after his work at uh, uh, Simon Fraser at FIU to really get the, the project to the next level with some funding from, from NSF. A couple really quick points and then I'm gonna hand it back to Aaron and then we're gonna have more of a discussion. I think the big things that we've learned, um, and this is like how to distill 20 years and probably about 150 or 200 human years uh, of work into a few slides. The first is that risk matters, um, and especially for these large body species. So even though these animals aren't ending up in the stomachs of sharks a lot, they're changing their behaviors in very, very large ways um, in order to stay safe. And so you can't just use diet data to figure out how important a predator is um, in an ecosystem. Um, and for, I'm on the turtle slide, so how do you practice turtle tackling? I'm glad I was a swimmer in college. Um, and the most important thing is to remember the boat is moving forward to jump as far to the side as you possibly can. And remember, the turtle is hard. Do not use your head uh, to subdue them. Um, that's another story, not involving Aaron or I. 
The second thing that we have seen um, experimentally in Shark Bay and then looking around the world at what's happened as shark populations have declined and, and turtle populations especially have rebounded is that the loss of some shark species could really cause big shifts, especially in seagrass ecosystems. And those consequences could cascade in very large ways. You know, uh, seagrasses are huge carbon stores. Um, and if you go from, you know, these sea bushes that grow two meters tall and have lots of habitat value, and you shift that to like well mowed lawns, there's not a lot of carbon sequestration and there's not a lot of habitat value for juvenile species to grow up that are really important for fisheries as well as for other organisms in the ecosystem. So, you know, we have really good evidence now that at least tiger sharks are probably ecologically very, very important in these, uh, these seagrass habitats. And then finally, our work that's coming out, out now and that uh, it, uh, Rob Nowicki, who finished his PhD and, and is now on to his, uh, his postdoc, is that the loss of predators may be really important, especially these sharks in eroding ecosystem resilience. So in some systems, losing sharks, you may not see immediate responses to the ecosystem. But if you add on top of that uh, extreme climate events, like in Shark Bay, we had this large marine heat wave that destabilized the seagrass ecosystem. Um, the loss of predators, we now kind of have an experiment to show that if you had overfishing plus that climate disturbance, you would cause a phase shift in the seagrass system. But if you maintain the shark populations, you should see it uh, rebound back to the more natural state with a lot higher habitat value. Right now, we're in the middle of, unfortunately, a giant natural experiment to see if that hypothesis is in fact correct. But you know, these predators is kind of, a loss of predators is a biotic multiplier of climate change is something that we have to be very, very concerned about. Um, now, on the long-term side, you, the science has been amazing, but there's a huge value to these projects beyond that. Um, and one that's hard to, to overestimate is just how much uh, the investment in people has mattered. And uh, our undergraduate assistants in Shark Bay who have come and done anything from a couple months to six months or more um, as parts of the field team, they've gone on to do great things. So, uh, Dr. Lindsay Marshall was uh, one of Aaron's assistants. Uh, not only did she get, finish her PhD, she is an amazing, one of the world's best marine illustrators. And she illustrated the entire book, Rays, Rays of the World. Uh, Adam Rosenblatt went on from our long assistant in Shark Bay, worked on a long-term ecological research project we have here in Florida studying alligators, um, and is now a, a faculty member at the University of North Florida. And Patrick Green, who's responsible for the video you saw, um, he is now a, uh, a filmmaker who won an Emmy Award, does uh, nature documentaries. You can check him out on National Geographic Channel with uh, Alaska Wildlife Rescue. And he also now does a lot of work on uh, K to 12 videos. And, and he and I still collaborate. And Aaron and I have worked on this as well. And we've really focused on how do we bring the field to the classroom. And these long-term projects help us tell stories that we can then put in frameworks for teachers all the way from kindergarten through university, use video to bring the methods and the ideas into the classroom, and then put real science around it. So uh, students aren't just hearing science and treating it as a series of facts, but they're actually doing it and engaging in projects. And so these are all things that came out of being in one area for a long enough time to really understand what's going on and slowly layer the science on um, and all the other uh, links that, uh, that we have as well. And you'll also see that that gives us a great uh, jumping off point uh, to other systems and uh, further collaborations. And uh, with that, back to you, Aaron. And by the way, if you haven't figured out yet, I talk too much. <laughs> All right, am I ready to share screen again? Share away. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll turn uh, chat responding duties over to Mike. And I, with that transition, am going to return to that promise I made roughly 12 years ago, right? And if you remember, that was to see if we could apply what we had, lear what we had learned in Shark Bay to understand the ecological impacts of some large predators uh, here in Washington, uh, particularly wolves, which were just beginning to recolonize Washington when I, when I uh, assumed my 
position here. In other words, we wanted to know whether we could sort of practice the art of amphibious ecology, right, from aquatic to terrestrial realms, if you'll be so kind as to indulge me. And to talk a little bit about that, I want, I'm going to return to the Shark Bay seascape, but this time, so Mike showed you a picture and talked about how the seagrass meadows are laid out with deep water, but I'm going to use a schematic from one of our recent papers. So what you can see here, this is a sort of schematic representation of how the Shark Bay seascape in our study area is laid out. Uh, what you can see over here is that you have a series of shallow banks, which again are in water depths typically less than four to five meters in depth. And they are covered by lush beds of seagrass, which in turn support diverse communities of seagrass fishes as well as invertebrates. And these shallow banks are interspersed with deeper channels, which as Mike mentioned, are a little bit more sort of ecologically impoverished and are dominated by sandy bottoms. And for the purposes of this little demonstration, the shallow banks can be further subdivided into, as I've done up here, interiors and edges. So basically the middle of the meadow and the edge of the shallow bank, which borders on deeper habitat. And file this away for later, but the reason that's important is the reason that we make this distinction is we want to divide parts of seagrass meadows that are far from the deep, the interiors, and close to the deep edge, because that's germane to how prey animals cope with the risk of tiger shark predation in this particular system. So there are a variety of large vertebrate consumers that Mike pointed out to you earlier that uh, utilize the resources provided by these shallow banks. I'm gonna focus on four now. Uh, Piscivorous pied cormorants and bottlenose dolphins that target the fishes, and then herbivorous green sea turtles and dugongs, which target the seagrass. And importantly, all four of these species we know from research in our uh, long-term investigation are potential food from tiger sharks, right? So while they're getting food, they also have to worry about becoming a meal themselves. And we also know from our system that tiger sharks aren't around for the full year. Typically for about three quarters of the year, they're in the system, but for about one quarter of the year, they're absent. When they're absent, these four consumers, as well as other species, use a mix of edge and interior parts of shallow banks targeting uh, fishes and seagrasses respectively. But something very interesting happens over these shallow banks when tiger sharks enter the scene, as you can see here. All four of these species shift their space use, but they don't do so in the same way. And that's what's critically important. So first of all, bottomless dolphins, green sea turtles, and dugongs push much more toward the edge of the shallow banks, much closer to deep water. Whereas pied cormorants push to the middle of seagrass meadows. Why this disparity? Well, we've learned over the years that it's explained very well by differences in the evasion tactics or means of getting away from sharks that these four consumers have. So let's consider the three that move to the closer to the edge first. So they, they're very different in many respects, but bottlenose dolphins, green sea turtles, and dugongs all use speed and subsurface maneuvers to get away from tiger sharks. And the way I often analogize this is as many of us were kids, we probably played the game shark, right? Where you had to jump into the pool and evade somebody who was already in there. And it's a lot easier to do so. Marco Polo being another example, right? In the deep end where you have enhanced water volume than it is in the shallow end where volume is cons constrained and it's easy for a would-be pursuer, a shark in this case, to actually line you up. Well, because these species are reliant upon water volume, greater depth for maneuvers, they benefit not only from pushing to the edge where the depth is a little bit greater because as you can see here, the bank is sloping down into the deep, but they also benefit from close proximity to the increased depth offered by those deep channels. So if they're bothered by a shark, zip, they can zip into the deep and then swim circles around sharks. Cormorants are very different. They fly away when they're accosted by a shark and it really does, their ability to do so is not impacted spatially by whether they're in the middle of a meadow or on the edge of a meadow. So unlike the other three species, we anticipated that their concern when sharks are in the environment and it's dangerous would be to minimize their likelihood of even being bothered by a shark in the first place. And we know from our long-term investigations that although sharks prefer the shallows over the deep, when they're, when they're hunting the shallow meadow habitats, they actually spend more time patrolling the edges than the middles. So by pushing to the interior with no ability to alter their escape likelihood, pied cormorants instead minimize 
they make the best of a bad decision by minimizing their likelihood of encountering tiger sharks, which allows them to spend more time foraging for fish over the seagrass. So the general idea that emerges from this is that if we know something about prey escape tactics, we can use that information to anticipate the responses, the spatial and behavioral responses of particular prey species to the threat posed by a predator. And, we have, and if we have multiple prey species living in the same system, we might be able to use differences in their evasion tactics to predict whether or not they're going to respond differently to the threat posed by a predator. Okay. Our next step was to determine, okay, so this is a marine model. Let's see if we can apply it amphibiously to a terrestrial system. And to do that, uh, several years ago, Mike and I ported this model over to montane habitats of Eastern Washington, highlighted here, where St. Patrick mule and white-tailed deer were coping with recolonization by gray wolves, which began moving into the state in uh, the, the late aughts, around 2008. Two things to quickly remember about this scenario. Mule and white tail, or at first, wolves are, of course, pack forming predators that importantly course their prey. In other words, they chase prey down over long distances, which allows them to identify vulnerable, vulnerable individuals that aren't running well and they attack those individuals. So, if you're a prey animal that's seeking to get away from wolves and you want to maximize your chance of not being the one that gets brought down, you want to position yourself in the landscape so that you can run well, which leads us to mule and white tailed deer. They look very similar on the surface, but they actually have skeletal and muscular differences that lead them to favor different running gates. Like elk and horses, white-tailed deer are fleet sprinters. They gallop away from predation risks. They favor their ability to actually outrun wolves, okay? Mule deer, on the other hand, they can gallop, but they're not very good at it. So instead, they use an alternative bounding or bouncing uh, running gate called stotting. It looks like they're bouncing on pogo sticks, okay? Not very good on flat ground, but highly effective at negotiating obstacles and moving fast over slope, broken terrain, okay? So based upon these differences, we anticipated that when confronted with the risk of wolf predation, these deer might push in opposite directions with white-tailed deer favoring flat ground that facilitates their ability to evade wolves by sprinting and mule deer favoring broken slope terrain that would favor their ability to get away from wolves using stotting. And that's exactly what we see. So by comparing nearby areas in North Central Washington that either had or did not have resident wolf packs, we were actually able to contrast the space use patterns of these two sympatric deer species and ask whether the presence of wolves had that predicted effect, which it did. So our areas that were occupied by the Ensetsin and Strawberry wolf packs saw a shift made by mule deer relative to the areas without wolves. Specifically, in the areas without wolves, both deer species broadly overlapped in low-lying country. And that's not too surprising because that's where more, um, more of the plants they target tend to be available. But when wolves were on the landscape, white-tailed deer largely stayed in place, but mule deer pushed significantly upslope toward broken terrain that favors their stotting tactic. And again, the reason that white-tailed deer largely stayed in place, we think, is because they really didn't need to go anywhere, right? Wolves and white-tailed deer both use the same terrain type to be able to run well. So their ability to get away from wolves was facilitated where they were before wolves even arrived. But mule deer, which would be at a huge disadvantage on flat ground, pushed up onto steep terrain, we infer, to cope with this new predation risk posed by recolonizing wolves. So if we mesh these two studies together, our long-term investigation in Shark Bay with this wolf-deer study in Eastern Washington, a general idea emerges, and that's the idea of an invasion, evasion landscape. In other words, in any system, marine or terrestrial, to be able to best predict how any prey species is likely to respond spatially to the presence of a predator, we need to understand that prey species evasion landscape, or in other words, the spatio-temporal pattern of its likelihood of being able to get away from that predator using its evasion tactic, right? Another way of saying that is the, the devil of predicting predator-prey interactions is always in the details, right? This really underscores that by understanding those subtle nuances of prey natural history, we have a better chance of, of anticipating how they're going to respond to predators in any given situation. 
And if I circle back to the sort of origin of this entire seminar then, I want to emphasize that although many different kinds of studies can furnish this sort of information, long-term studies give us the best chance, right? Because they afford us the opportunity in place, in situ, to make those kind of sustained, systematic, careful observations that furnish us with those natural history details, like evasion behavior, that can allow us to put together an evasion landscape, which can ultimately be used as a predictive model for anticipating how different prey species are gonna to respond to predators, and whether and when different prey assemblages will respond differently to the same shared prey. Uh, with that, um, I'm gonna maintain control of the slides, but I'll let Mike do his Shark Bay acknowledgements. Yeah, and, and you know, the real thanks here is to a huge team, um, and, and you can't thank them all. I mean, I didn't even manage to fit all the pictures of the uh, graduate students that were worked on the project. So I think that really shows how much effort's gone into it. Obviously, you know, we have to thank Larry. Jim Forkren is a faculty member at FIU who's one of the world's experts in seagrasses who really helped take uh, the work we did all the way down to the base of the ecosystem. Um, and you know, we couldn't have done it without the more than 100 undergraduate field assistants uh, that helped us out. We also benefited a lot from the local knowledge. And you know, from the first trip I went down there, um, some of the, the local Aboriginal community, the Agile Abor Aboriginal Corporation has been, it was a huge help to me, was a huge help to my, my students going forward. And kind of working you know, with people on that traditional knowledge and um, going in with that respect for the local community, both the Aboriginal community, but also the, the kind of the local that had been there for generations. Um, you know, they taught us how to catch turtles uh, for the first time. Um, you know, they came up with the best nicknames. Um, Aaron, should we talk about thorny devil eggs? I'll leave that to your students later. Um, and the other thing that just for our undergrads to think about is when you want to start this stuff when people are scrolling impossible on your, uh, on your grant proposals, you got to be pretty entrepreneurial. Um, and really getting some of the first things off the grounds was someone at Singapore Airlines was willing to let me fly to Australia really cheap and put as much gear on those planes for free as I could, could load up. Mercury Marine gave us, uh, you know, really cheap engines and turned them over and, and cheap boats. The Monkey Maya Dolphin Resort there, they gave us free accommodation, access to make ridiculous things in their, in their machine shop. And then, you know, we were able to get the help from National Geographic and ultimately uh, the National Science Foundation. But, you know, for, for all the letters of sure we'll help you out, I could wallpaper my cubicle at Simon Fraser with the letters that said, go away, go away and never talk to us again. And how dare you have written me. So have a thick skin. You're going to get lots of rejections. Don't take it personal learn the lessons you can from it and just keep pushing forward because um, it, it's a great gig. There are great things you can do out there. If you build the right teams, be a real team player and collaborator and, you know, keep going to the sources to, uh, to, to make things happen. So, um, you know, huge thanks to so many people that I, ca I can't even name. Aaron, back to you. All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, same for the Wolf Study. It hasn't been running uh, as long as the Shark Bay project, but it was certainly a, a very large team effort. And I really can't thank all the individuals and entities that, that played a major role. So I'm just going to highlight a few, uh, two really. One, I'm going to really give a special shout out to the three PhD students on whose work this, this Wolf Deer story was based. Justin Dellinger, who's currently a carnivore research scientist for the state of California. Carolyn Shores, who's currently a caribou biologist up in Williams Lake, British Columbia for the BC government, and April Craig, who's just wrapping up her PhD research that focuses on whether by changing deer behavior, wolves indirectly affect plants. So an exciting uh, project of hers coming right down the pipe. And the other thing I really want to emphasize, which sort of echoes what uh, Mike said about Shark Bay, is that our, critical re our most critical research partner on this effort was the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Colville and their Fish and Wildlife Department. They extended a generous offer for us to be able to work on their lands, provided their expertise, and have just been wonderful research partners throughout this entire process. So I want to give a special shout out to them as well, because it's just been such a pleasure to benefit from their uh, deep knowledge about the, the, the ecosystem and all their partnership on this endeavor. Okay, we've reached the questions phase. 
And I know we've already got lots of questions. So Mike, were you, were you looking, are there ones that we haven't been able to get to from earlier that we should start with? You know, I, I, I've been typing furiously as I, I, I think you have to try to keep up with them. You know, one of the questions was about the, uh, you know, how do we learn about the diets of these animals? And I think that's where, uh, you know, it's been kind of a, a try every possible method that's out there. So some is observational with the species we can follow or where we can put cameras on the backs of animals to record their uh, feeding. We've used stable isotopes, fatty acids. Uh, we're starting to use cloacal swabs where you can get DNA from the cloaca and try to, you know, run that through a blast. Although that has some technical hurdles if you get the food of the prey of the prey, uh, it appears. So uh, working on that, but, but really we've tried everything we can to put together kind of the, those feeding links. But again, what we're finding is that some of the over, you know, the overwhelming effect sizes appear to be because of how behavior has changed as animals try to stay safe um, rather than, uh, than just how much do they eat. And I mean, that may partially be because we have so many animals that live a long time and they have to invest very heavily in anti-predator -beha behavior. And the visibility kind of stinks. And so, you know, you have to try to stay away from sharks because you're not going to be able to, to necessarily outmaneuver them. And so I think that's another direction we're going is how much does that visibility level affect the strength of the, the top-down influence of the sharks. Uh, you know, anyone else feel free, unmute, jump in, or, or type something up here. Otherwise, I'm going to have to, you know, embarrass myself with the next slide while we wait for, uh, for somebody to, uh, to ask a question that we haven't answered here yet. And yeah, if anybody answered a question earlier that we didn't get to, please type it back in, because there, there's, a long, there's a long string here, and I know there are a bunch. I saw several, Mike, people asking, how do I get involved in this kind of work? Do I, do I have to see a specific advertisement or what do I do to separate myself from the crowd and join Shark Bay or something else? Well, I'll, I'll just look, you should always be looking for opportunities to get involved and, you know, send emails to people say, hey, do you have any opportunities that may or may not be, uh, be advertised? I mean, you know, right now we don't have field teams going out, obviously. But, um, you know, we're, we're recruiting people to watch videos of coral reef sharks from around the world to help us count them as part of that global fin print project. Um, I even recruited my mom, who I think is up to like 3,000 hours of video she's watched uh, during quarantine. Um, but, you know, just try to get involved in anything because you'll see what you like, you'll learn a lot, you know, even if you end up doing something very different. Um, but do look out for job ads and, you know, because we usually post on, on the different listservs opportunities that there are out there so we can get lots of different uh, applications in. And I will, I, I put this in the chat, but uh, we have a project in Madagascar at FIU that is specifically for assistantships for both undergrad and grad students. And, you know, we're hoping we can kick that back off sometime in 2021. Um, it's open to students from any institution. So, so please have a, a look for that because some of the same species, also some of the ones that are dry, uh, but whatever you like, um, but, no matter what it is, get involved if this is a field that you want to uh, move forward in. Just, just briefly added to that, uh, keep in mind, especially for undergrads, that uh, get to know your professors in your classes and get to know their grad students because the grad students in particular are always looking for help on campus, in the lab, as well as out in the field. And they are great resources and they're going to give you the kind of high responsibility training that even if your first step isn't to get out in the field on one of these projects is going to lead to that. Yeah. Down the and, and at major research institutions like UW and FIU, there are lots of grad students doing work all the time and they need your help, but they don't always know that you want to help. So reach out. Exactly. And so here's another one for you, Aaron. So, uh, you know, any comparisons between you know, the uh, wolf prey interactions, in areas where wolves have been there continuously versus areas where they're reintroduced. So does it matter if they were gone and then come back versus always, always there? Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I could spend all day on this one, you know? In, <laughs> so uh, in North America, wolves were extirpated from a virtually all of their lower 48 range. Of course they did retain much of their range in, in Canada. And Alaska, but even there they are heavily managed. So uh, Laura Pru, who I think is in the audience, would know more than I do about what's going on in Alaska. But from, from what I understand, it's awfully hard to find a place with wolves that hasn't been tampered with to some degree. 
So we really lack that true reference point, right? So most wolf science in North America has been undertaken in areas either where wolves have always been but are hunted or in areas where wolves were absent and then have recovered or have been reintroduced like Yellowstone or central Idaho or now here in the Pacific Northwest. What I can say about that though is there are neat studies on other predator-prey assemblages, some of which include wolves, like in Eurasia, uh, that have asked that question of how prey responses differ in systems where predators are newly recovering versus where predators have always been. So there are a cool series of studies by Joel Berger, for example, comparing areas, uh, prey responses by animals <laughs> ranging from bison and elk and moose uh, in areas that have always had sort of an intact assemblage of predators, including things like tigers and gray wolves and brown bears, to areas that are where those predators are largely absent or, for example, where wolves are recovering. And the outcomes are complex, but they do suggest to some extent that some of the more nuanced anti-predator tactics of prey can be lost from systems where the predators have been absent for a while. So they might be more, so, Anti-predator might, behavior might be more diverse, more deeply ingrained, and more dramatic in areas that have long had the predators versus areas that have just gotten them back as prey sort of relearn some of those tactics. But again, that's a very, very new area of research. And I think as Mike would agree, especially in terrestrial systems, our challenge is almost all of ecology has occurred sort of post-1950 in an era where we were already missing all the predators. We just don't have good baselines. But of course, that underscores the few areas like Shark Bay in a marine setting, which can kind of function as a baseline. We need to find those baselines. And there are a few spots in terrestrial systems, for example, in the Russian Far East, where you do have fairly intact assemblages. There are these epic ecosystems with tigers, leopards, brown bears, and wolves, all in the same system. We need more work in those kinds of systems. Of course, the African savanna comes to mind as well. Great question. Yeah. And, and so another question here in the Q&A um, about, you know, why funding for long-term research is declining. And I mean, I'll let Aaron add on to this. I mean, I think it's, it's a couple areas. One is, I think, you know, there's just such pressure to produce specific results quickly. Um, and, you know, one of the jokes with NSF funding is you have to have like 90% of your project done before they'll fund it because they want to make sure it's going to work. And so you're kind of always like almost one step behind. Um, and I think there's actually, you know, reviewers tend to, I mean, we've, we've seen this before, even though you're doing something very different in a very different set of questions, they'll say, oh, haven't you already done this? And so if people don't look deeply at what you're doing, they may not see that this is actually a new and continuation versus, um, you know, something that is valuable. And I think there's also a tendency for people to think, oh, long term is the same as just monitoring. And that that should be something that the state does or the, the federal, you know, just kind of like an agency, you know, rather than more science, like an NSF type funding. And I think that it is something that, you know, the long-term ecological research uh, program um, and people are trying to reverse because part of it, you know, the value is the serendipity. I mean, our work in Florida on, on the LTER there, um, we went from studying animal behavior and animal personalities to responses to extreme events. Um, just because so many happened and we had such long data sets. And it, it's hard to convince people that that, that happens. I think we're going to see the pendulum swing back because you're going to need those long-term data sets to do statistically robust analyses of the impact of these, you know, intense short-lived events that are, are predicted to become more frequent and more extreme through time. So if you're going to have even that, that kind of climate change, climate response uh, understanding of ecosystems, you're going to have to have it. Uh, anything, Aaron? Uh, I'm probably completely wrong, but that's my thoughts. No, no, you nailed it from my perspective. Yeah, I'm glad you brought the uh, the idea of serendipity. I remember there was a paper by Jim Estes and colleagues a few years ago about the value of ecological surprises for finding new for providing new insights and. They, they pointed out that it was from a lot of these sort of ongoing long-term investigations that surprises arose. You know, you sort of have to learn enough about a system before that kind of serendipity can occur, before you uproot and leave. And so, yeah, truly great value in working in places long enough. And you also, you also develop this kind of intimate understanding that in itself 
leads to new questions, right? The reason Shark Bay has proliferated is because we've been there long enough that no, we're, we're not just monitoring the same thing, but there's this sort of synergy of all those projects going together that have really led to more questions than answers. You know, as, as far as the, the challenge, the, the one other thing um, I would add is that, you know, we've got some questions about advantages of shorter term work. Obviously, shorter term work is more nimble and allows you to diversify your portfolio, right? So there is the, the limitation of putting all your eggs in one basket research wise. And, and, you know, we're in a situation now, right, it, sort of a crisis era in conservation where there's a lot of pressure on a lot of scientists to do a lot of things at the same time. That doesn't always lend itself to initiating long-term work. So I don't wanna, we don't wanna uh, create the idea that short-term work isn't valuable. It absolutely has its huge value, but rather to advocate that so too does long-term work. Yeah, yeah it's more don't forget long-term research, yeah. not it is you know, inherently better. Um, the next question, Aaron, because we don't have enough to do, I mean, uh, you know, somebody just asked a question that needs to be a paper actually. Um, and, and this is, you know, the parallels between shark and wolf management. And I actually think that they're probably just, I just started thinking about this when you answer, asked that. So great question. Um, and I think there are some, you know, uh, important parallels. I think one is that, you know, sharks, Need, we need to be focused on rebuilding the way wolf reintroductions have been prioritized. And I think that's a, a fairly new thought. I mean, a lot of it was just stop the slide. Um, and we still need to do that. But now we need to be thinking ahead to restoring ecological function. But I think the challenges in that are going to be different in some ways, which is sharks tend to be targeted much more broadly. Um, you know, it's, it's a little harder to you know, section sharks out than it is say, hey, don't, let's not hunt the wolves or shoot wolves. But you have similar problems as you rebuild populations where you start to have higher depredation and where you can move from support for conservation to push back in certain groups. And so I think one of the big parallels there is that critical piece of involving people and stakeholders in the process of talking about making decisions and then implementing management. So I think that there's some really cool parallels to be drawn and probably lessons to be learned, especially from, you know, the, the what we've learned about wolf reintroductions to be applied to sharks, um, maybe rather than vice versa at this stage, but, but great question. That is a super question. The, the one little thing I would add is another major parallel there is the power of a polarizing animal to make conservation challenging, right? Whether Mike and I were giving talks about sharks to the public, or whether we're, we're, whether we're talking about wolves, right? They, these are polarizing species. People have very strong opinions about them. And the reality is they, they, they do pose a threat and they can create conflict. So I think comparing shark and wolf management is a really good way of sort of identifying means by which we can sort of tamp down the fear and the misinformation a little bit to reduce that polarization, to promote the benefits that these kinds of species provide. Dan, I see you turned your camera on, so I want to give you the opportunity to jump in here if you wanted to. Yeah, there's one. It looks like there's one more question. Maybe we'll take that one last question and then wrap up for the hour. Oh, okay. sounds good. Was, was it the, the who decides when predators can become reintroduced? Yeah. Yes. Mike, you want to take a stab at that one first? Well, I, being a wolf expert, I mean, just kidding. Well, I mean, on, on sharks, I mean, it, it really is a very complicated question because the management of sharks, depending on where you are, could be, you know, working with local communities. It could be working at international levels um, with CITES, with regional fisheries management organizations, you know, with national fisheries departments. So for sharks, we haven't really gotten to reintroductions. It's more, you know, when do you start trying to rebuild? And, you know, so each country or international uh, agreement is a very different uh, discussion, but then it's also a different discussion and, and kind of constant work with governments and local communities as populations start to rebuild to talk about, you know, what, what do you do when you get into challenging situations and, you know, having even been involved in Reunion Island where there was, you know, lots of fatal attacks. It's, it's a very complicated and, and unique situation in, in each spot, which, uh, it's probably somewhat similar to, to the terrestrial setting, but um, it's a little bit more diffuse question in the oceans. Aaron, anything on the wolves? Yeah, I, I really like this question and I can actually relate it to uh, a recent sabbatical I spent in um, Australia. So 
that, that I think historically, at least in terrestrial settings, it's been charisma, right? Which tends to lead to the public and political wherewithal and motivation, which I think has really helped because there are a lot of pro-wolf advocates out there with wolf reintroductions, but probably helped less so with less appreciated predators. But if we circle back, I think the value of some of these ecological studies is that insofar as they can reveal the ecological roles that are played by these various predators, that can be motivation in and of itself. So when I was in Australia, I was working with some dingo biologists. And dingoes, of course, are highly controversial species. They are actually controlled at the government level in Australia. But there's an incipient debate about whether they provide ecological benefits that should be a motivation for reintroducing dingoes to certain areas. And the thing that, that tickled me is that results from the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction and the ensuing ecosystem changes that followed wolf recovery were being used by a variety of biologists and members of the public and politicians in Australia as justification for thinking about dingoes not as a pest, but perhaps possibly as a very ecologically important top predator that was worthy of conservation rather than elimination. So I, I think increasingly it's incumbent upon us in the scientific community to change the frame for how these predators are viewed, not in terms of charisma, but in terms of ecological roles. Great. Well, thank you both. And thanks for the really uh, engaged audience and for your active uh, responsiveness to all the questions. I think this is one of the really nice advantages of having two presenters and a, and a chat stream and a Q and a session going on in parallel. This has been really engaging and interesting. So thank you both. Thanks for traveling all this way out here, Mike, and uh, getting away from the cold in Florida. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. And have a great uh, holiday break. Thanks, everybody. Have Thanks a great everyone. one.